Janet's an expert in organizational behavior. Uh, she's been chairman of the man our management department, and now is our senior associate dean. Her research is in the area, one of her areas of research is in the area of ethics. She's done quite a few papers on it and different things, but really brings in expertise. And I know this very well because Janet and I co-teach a class on organizational corruption and control, which is one of our new signature classes for freshmen. So I've seen and learned an awful lot working with her. So I'm gonna turn it over to Janet and let her start. Okay, well, thank you very much for being here, and uh, welcome to UT and Holmes and to this conference, uh, and I think we'll have a lot of fun. So my instructions uh, were to be relatively brief, to tell you, and, and, that, and that should be a problem, because uh, we really want to, uh, to get um, a lot of discussion. So what I'm gonna do is to tell you a bit about what we know about the trust, uh, how to build it, and then uh, just generate a lot of discussion in terms of your experiences in your uh, organizations about uh, trust, you know, um, how can be built, how, uh, you know, what, what, are, what are more problematic uh, issues about building trust in the organization, et cetera. Okay, so hopefully we'll have a lively discussion. Uh, so, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about some interesting trends that uh, we've seen uh, in organizations. So, 59% uh, uh, of all 2001 web purchases made in the U.S. were done at the workplace. 47% of employees spend at least a half an hour a day cruising the web for personal reasons. 30 to 40% of employee internet activity is for personal reasons. And 70% of internet porn traffic occurs during workday hours. Now we don't know if it's done at the workplace, but it's suspicious given that it's during, you know, eight to five, okay? So what are companies doing about this rampant waste of time at work? 60% of employers use software to monitor incoming and outgoing email, and 25% had terminated an employee for violating the company's email policy. 76% monitor an employee's website connections. 65% use software to block connections to some sites. And then 26% fired employees for misusing um, the internet. Now I know at the University of Texas, you know, pretty much every computer is monitored very closely. Uh, um, so, you know, we feel watched all the time. Now you may say, okay, um, at first blush, I think this is good. You know, we need to watch every keystroke of every single employee uh, who is at the job. Uh, and, you know, I might agree with you in terms of porn, but, you know, we might want to think about, you know, what's the problem of this excessive monitoring in terms of what employees are doing at the workplace? Well, and, and these are really, this, uh, it, it is a very good article about this, and I'm, I'm just rampantly stealing um, from Pfeffer, who wrote an article in HBR. What, what Pfeffer argues is that, you know, this you know, excessive monitoring of, of this traffic that can go on during the workplace um, potentially can lead to increased absenteeism. You know, most uh, families now, most two-person uh, two families um, have uh, work. Uh, so we don't see, um, you know, many um, stay-at-home uh, moms anymore. And often now, especially in the current uh, environment, many uh, people have more than one job, which means that there's not a lot of time to get um, important uh, personal uh, work done. Uh, so if we don't allow some of this, uh, you know, whether it's banking or purchasing or whatever done um, during the workplace hours, then we may see increased absenteeism as people take um, time off in order to get some of these activities done, okay? We also find that people report um, a lot of increased stress uh, as a result of being monitored. Uh, 
uh, and knowing that they're being monitored, which potentially can lead to decreased motivation uh, at work. We also find that the phenomenon that's called psychological reactance, uh, in which when people are told that they can't do something, uh, that something sometimes can become much more enticing than it ordinarily would be. So, you know, imagine, you know, when you get on a plane, soon as that, that you know, seatbelt sign goes on, suddenly you have to go to the restroom. No, so, and similarly, you know, you know, the fact that, you know, no longer are you allowed to send personal emails or cruise on the web, you know, that those, you know, by, by virtue of prohibiting it, it may make it more attractive than it ordinarily was. Okay. Also, you know, what we find is um, that, you know, the self-fulfilling prophecy may occur. You know, the research indicates that when we believe, for instance, and label someone as smart, uh, we uh, react uh, toward them in such a way that, you know, that we believe that they are actually are smarter and we encourage behavior so that they actually become smarter. <coughs> Similarly, there is what's been called the Gollum effect, that if we label someone as inferior, that we act toward them in ways that encourages that inferior behavior. So what Pfeffer argues is that if we label employees as potentially dishonest and stealing you know, com precious company time, that we may act toward them in such a way that fulfills that prophecy. And there's been some really fascinating research which suggests that um, this increased surveillance may actually lead supervisors to set up entrapment. So set up opportunities to try to, you know, trick employees to, um, you know, to kind of justify the increased surveillance that's been put in place uh, and lead them to uh, commit these so-called crimes. Uh, and then finally, you just really can't create a climate of trust when you um, have these types of situations. So there was a very neat experiment that was done in which supervisors were asked to, uh, you know, observe uh, multiple employees, and one of them they were told was, you know, you know they were supposed to watch very closely, and even though the employees performed identically the one that they were told to monitor more closely, they reported as lower levels of trust. Um, and they thought that they were, you know, less, you know, really didn't perform as well. So this increased monitoring has some costs. And it has some costs in particular in terms of uh, trust. So we can ask ourselves, you know, what does it feel like to work in a low trust environment? Well, you know, people report that it's very stressful, it feels very threatening, it's very divisive, uh, unproductive, intense. As opposed to in a high trust environment, it's fun, feels supportive, motivating, productive, and comfortable. So we can ask ourselves then, what is trust? Well, I guess I was cruising on the internet. I pulled this definition. <laughs> Hopefully my employer thinks I was actually working. Um, this is from Merriam-Webster's online dictionary. Assured reliance on the character, ability, strength, or truth of someone or something. It's another definition. Confident reliance on someone when you are in a position of vulnerability. And I think this is really applicable uh, in when we think about trust in a workplace setting, because oftentimes, you know, in, uh, our employees are in vulnerable situ uh, situations and that they rely on their supervisors for a variety of things. All right, components of trust. We can break trust out into three basic components. There's strategic trust, which relates to the amount of trust that members of the organization have in terms of how they think that the top management of the organization you know, has a clear vision, 
of what the organization is doing and is adequately deploying the resources of that organization in order to achieve that vision. All right, so you know, you know, do the people who are at the top of this organization, do they know where we're going and do they know how we're gonna get there? That's basically strategic trust. Personal trust refers to kind of that more intimate relationship between an employee and his or her direct supervisor. So can I believe that the person who I, to whom I report um, acts in my best interest? You know, or you know, are they going to undercut me so, um, or retaliate um, against me? And finally, organizational trust refers to is there a belief that the organization uses fair processes uh, when uh, promotion decisions or merit-based uh, decisions are made in, um, in the organization. Okay, and I'm gonna come back to that because that's a really important thing. All right, what are some enemies of trust? All right, inconsistent messages uh, so, you know, saying on the one side, you're really important here, and then on the other side, you know, what's your name again? You know, I, I get a great example of this. Um, and, you know, most of what happens with inconsistency is just not paying attention. You know, um, we, at the university, we um, have two basic classes of faculty. Uh, on the one hand, we have what are called tenured faculty. So these are people who um, are basically do engage in research and teaching. And then in addition to our tenure track faculty, we, have, we hire lecturers um, who kind of pinch hint for, for us. You know, they'll come in who teach um, as needed. Okay, um, but they, um, they, they don't engage in, in the research mission of the university. Uh, and, but they're very valued, and we think of them as very valued because they, 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 they um, uh, contribute to the teaching mission of the university, um, but you know, sometimes they often will feel like second class citizens uh, because they don't uh, contribute to the research part of the mission um, of the university. Now we don't ever want to, to, to say to their face, oh, you're second class citizens, but subtly, um, I think we do that. So for instance, one of the ways I had a meeting with them and they said, well, we, you, not me personally, but you as a tenure track faculty uh, make us feel as second class citizens because you know, at the very first fall um, faculty meeting, you only introduced the new tenure track faculty meetings who were hired and you didn't introduce the new lecturers who were hired. You know, that's a great example. I mean, I don't think, you know, it was in anyone's mind of, oh, we're going to, you know, crush these people into the ground and make them feel like dirt. But that was an inadvertent way in which, you know, and that just it destroys trust in the organization of saying, you know, I'm just not very important here. So, you know, as managers, you know, we have to constantly be thinking of the symbolic natures of our actions because that has a direct impact on how people feel. Is this a trusting place here? Can I trust that you know, I'm going to be valued in this organization? All right, another enemy of trust. Inconsistent standards. So, you know, and, and we often see this, you know, there's this, you know, say superstar in the organization and you know maybe we'll bend the you know the rules for this person a little bit. Uh, you know people are hyper vigilant in organizations and they are constantly watching. And so if they notice that someone is getting an extra perk that someone else isn't uh, for unfair reasons, uh, that's going to destroy trust. Misplaced benevolence. I think this is a really important one. Uh, it's very easy for us to, uh, you know, oh, to, you know, kind of, you know, let's let's just ignore the fact that we've got Joe over there, and Joe is really not very good, but it's too much work to get rid of him. 
So we'll kind of just park Joe in the little basement office and give him some meaningless tasks to do because it's easier just to let him just sit there as opposed to go through the whole process of trying to terminate him. Well, it may be easier for you as the manager to do that, but it has a really very, very undercutting effect on the rest of the organization because all of your good performers are sitting there going, yeah, Joe is drawing down a paycheck. You know, and you know, is this really a good utilization of resources? Uh, or, you know, there are some or, uh, members of the organization, I'm sure, I know I experience this, but maybe you do as well, who are um, perhaps competent, but mean. They're just nasty people. And so we just kind of, you know, you know, and we, these are the type of people who really, you know, that you can't put them on teams because they, you know, they, they don't work, they don't play nice. Uh, so again, you know, rather than dealing with them directly, uh, we just try to ignore the problem. Um, and this destroys trust as well. So not dealing with problematic employees. Another enemy of trust. Elephants in the park. Ignoring a politically charged situation. So imagine, for instance, they, let's say someone has uh, got, have been fired in the organization. Uh, you know, rather, you know, you may not in that situation, you know, be able to legally or for whatever reason disclose all of the gory details. But not talking about it at all, uh, you know, leads to problems. And that's closely related to the next one, which is, you know, when there are, are rumors that are circulating in the organization. Uh, you know, so, you know, let's say that, you know, there's potential layoff that's going to occur, not talking about it at all. You know, what we find is, you know, when there's an absence of information, people rush to fill it. And, you know, they'll make things up uh, because, you know, in general, it's just, an, it's just a factor of human nature. We don't like to deal with uncertainty. So we'll just make things up uh, in order to, you know, kind of reduce our uncertainty. One of the uh, classes that I used to teach um, utilized a, a behavioral simulation in which um, the students would uh, assume the top uh, management team position. And so in one of the simulations, it was great. They either start out, they, they run the organization for a full day. And they, you know, the positions are from the president down to vice president level. So imagine a room of 14, you know, you know these are MBA students, and they're running around and they're, you know, they're making decisions. And the president and the COO get together at about 8.45 in the morning and, and they, they're making a decision about how to restructure this organization. And they whisper, and now they're, and everyone's looking around, and then they write. It's hilarious. They write. Big announcement. 10 o'clock. Oh. And then they, they don't say anything more than that. No one does any work from 8.45 <laughs> until 10 o'clock. They're, you know, they're all going, <laughs> and they're, you know, they're moving around, they're getting into little coffee clans, I, and, and this was a simulation. But you know, I'm sure, that this happens in your organization all the time. So, you know, when something's gonna, now, you know, when we talked about this afterward, of, you know, well, how could you have better handled this? I mean, you know, saying, you know, and again, you, even if you say, I don't know what's going to happen, you know, it, it's better than, you know, hiding it. You know, so you may say, all right, we know that there may be some layoffs. We don't know the full extent. You know, at least having some open chains of communication will go an enormously long way, as opposed to just not talking at all. Because if you don't talk at all, believe me, you'll have some employees who will pretend that they have some cherished information and will act as though it's true. Uh, and that can just be uh, horrible. Okay, so why is organizational 
um, trust so important? And it's interesting, uh, Cynthia alluded to this um, in her talk as well. Um, it, uh, uh, this comes from um, the 2007 National Business Ethics Survey. So 54% of employees who did not report this conduct that they observed um, in the workplace were skeptical that their report would make a difference. You know, and, and, and in this report, it was interesting. Um, it's not that they necessarily felt that they would be retaliated against. It's just they didn't think it would make a difference. You know, that, you know, they didn't think that they, you know, that, that someone would, would, you know, that there would be retribution. It just, thought, you know, no one would care. Why bother? So, you know, this personal trust in the manager isn't enough. What seems to make a difference is organizational trust. You know, that, you know, that, that, there's, that the organization is actually going to act upon the information and that the organization has fair procedures, which is really part of this ethical climate that we're talking about. So, you know, it, it's not just having that personal trust in my manager, because that's really where, what we're talking about when we're thinking about, well, is there going to be any retribution if I blow the whistle? You know, but that's just not enough. You know, I really have to believe that my organization uh, has processes and procedures that will make a difference in order for me to do something. So what, what makes, what um, influences fair procedures? Okay. You know, we can think about uh, organizational trust or um, in, in as having kind of two components. We, we think about distributive versus procedural trust. Distributive uh, uh, processes refer to outcomes, you know, whether we're getting just outcomes, just or fair outcomes <coughs> um, versus the process itself. And we like to differentiate those because uh, the, while the former is important, you know, having outcomes that I think are fair um, is important. What we find from the research is that the process is even more important. So I like to make sure that what I'm getting is fair, but how I am getting it is even more important to me. So there's a great story about um, a woman uh, who uh, gets a, a ticket for supposedly uh, running a red light, but you know, the light actually wasn't red. So, you know, she decides she's going to protest it. And, you know, so she, she's waiting for her day in court. She's, you know, she's got her evidence, she's got a witness. Says, no, the light wasn't red, it just was grossly unfair. She got this ticket. So she gets in front of the judge, and you know, the judge says, I I'm waiting for the ticket. And she goes, well, wait, you, you know, you can, I want to tell my story. Goes, no, no, I'm just waiting. Now, when this is a case of <coughs> distributive justice, she got a fair outcome because she hadn't run the red light, and so the outcome was fair for her, but she went away saying, uh, -huh, wait a minute, it wasn't procedural justice for her because she didn't get to say why should she get that outcome. So even though she didn't have to pay the ticket, so you know she should have been just thrilled, right? But she wasn't. So what we find is that you know you can eat, get all the rewards that you think you deserve, but if you don't get them fairly, that you don't feel as good as you might. So this 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 procedural justice is very important to employees. So you know how do we get through this? Get through this? Well, in part, it's engagement. It's you know including people in the decision making process. You know by including people, by having people give some input in terms of, for instance, how decisions are made. Uh, people will understand the rationale for the decisions as well as will feel more committed to it. Um, explaining the rationale for the decisions. You know how rewards are being allocated, uh, how promotions are being made, what's the basis for it. If we're changing something in the organization, if we're putting in new compliances, new rules, 
you know, what's the reason for them? So they don't just seem arbitrary. Uh, that goes a long way. So it's really having an extensive communication system in the organization. Now it's amazing to me that if you look at organizations, organizations tend to do a much better job explaining to the outside world. You know, so they have PR departments that focus on explaining what the organization does to its external constituencies and often forgets, you know, you have internal constituents. You have your employees. And you know, we often just forget you know, to explain, well, what are we doing internally? And those, you, know, you, should, you should have an internal PR department who just focuses on your employees and explains, you know, okay, we, we have a change now in you know, our, our healthcare benefits. You know, what, why did this happen? You know, because, you know, so that employees don't feel as though, well, you know, this organization doesn't care about me. And then finally, expectation clarity. So let's say something does change. Let's say, you know, now we are changing the way in which we are evaluating uh, employees that, you know, we have to be very clear that they understand how the rules of the game have changed. Uh, so that, you know, they don't feel as though it's arbitrary in terms of their performance. Okay, all right, so I, that I would be short enough so that we could can talk. So what I wanted to pose to you was, um, in your experience, what were some of the factors that uh, um, kind of erode trust? What are some you know, crises that have a big impact on trust? And then the, the second part of that is, you know, when these occur, then how can we recover? So how can we rebuild trust? So those are the kind of the two things that I wanted to talk about. So I've talked enough. It's your turn. Okay, don't talk, talk all at once. Then I can wait here a long time. Leadership. <laughs> yeah. Our company is 85 years old. It's a family-owned business. On January 1, 2008, it was split among the two grandsons who now are presidents of two separate companies. Okay. And this was rumored for 18 months, perhaps. About six months prior to it taking place, finally, okay. the two presidents brought their employees together and made the announcement. Okay. So, so what, in that sense, what, you know, so, so that, so we're talking about a, a split. So, what were people doing during this time? Lots of talk, no, no facts, <coughs> lots of what ifs. And just a week ago, Monday, one of the companies moved physically away from the corporate headquarters. And now we have our own building, and things are much better. The people have settled down, they're calm, okay. and they're really concentrating on this. Okay. What do you think could have been done differently that, that would have helped? The upfront announcement to the upfront. employees. I did some uh, I did some uh, research uh, for the Navy, and you know they they talked about because you know their commanders routinely you know rotate 
So, you know, these, it, you kind of felt sorry for the commanders because they have these great initiatives, but all the people underneath them, you know, said, well, well why should we do anything? Because you're going to be rotated out in two years. So, yeah, yeah, yeah good idea. I'm easily amused, as you can tell. <laughs> I have to do my job. Okay, what else? I think what um, the woman just described is, is something that can emerge in writing it often in our social program and the changing to the older in terms of what works and things. And so we really are <coughs> going to trust in to go to the somebody, you know, it takes, you know, takes credit, takes for, credit. For, for the work that his teammate did okay. yeah. uh, because he can speak well and the other and the other guy is not as great a speaker. Right. And so he gets the credit when it wasn't his work, yeah. that type of thing. Yeah. yeah and, and, and I, you know, and I think, and you, you can see organizations differ in terms of their culture of allowing that and some of them will reward. Yes. Uh, you know, they're, I mean, that I mean, it, it's hey, if, if you're clever enough that you can steal someone's work, good for you. Uh, whereas other organizations, you know, I mean, it, you know, integrity is a is such an important value that that would be punished. You know? Right. But then, you know, but there there's some you know there's some structures that that actually promote that or you know or allow it. Exactly. You know, tolerate it. I guess would be a better word. Right. Right. Yeah, so we can look almost on a continuum of, you know, organizations that, you know, promote it, allow it because uh, they're just not paying attention, you know, and, and they're not vigilant enough versus other organizations that, you know, would actively seek it out and punish it. Right. Yeah, that's a good point. What else? This is a, you know, kind of a good, the opposite of splitting, you can think of mergers. That's a, usually a time when you have a lot of, you know, consternation. Yes. There's a, a unique situation going on. I thought Boeing, in their negotiation with the, the union, they put the unions literally put Boeing over the barrel in 
that they have a couple of airplanes they're trying to relaunch in the market for a lot of a lot of investment that they put into it. However, the union doesn't realize that because of the economic downturn that they're trying to prolong or to postpone deliveries of some of the airplanes because the funds the people are trying desperately out there that the airlines that want to buy those airplanes kind of wait, 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 because right now we don't have the money. So the catch is that you, you, you don't, the unions are not working in, a, in, in an area of trust with management. At the same time, management's not in an area of trust with their with their uh, airlines that they're selling airplanes to. Uh, between the, the, the multiple directions that it's pulling everyone, uh, they're not going to go anywhere. Nothing's happening, and it probably what used to be a one-month strike is probably going to go three or four months, and a lot of people are going to get hurt. A lot of, uh, and, and, and then the next union comes up, their engineering union comes up next, and they're going to strike as well. So you got uh, this real strong company that's going to be on its knees. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, yeah. It was certainly, I think, in terms of. Anytime you have this, this these labor management disputes, you, you know, I mean, that you really have a lot of problems. With it. Yeah. Other examples? Yeah, actually, using airlines or AIG, when you have top management going to employees and saying, "We need your help. We need to make these cuts," which American did with their unions, and then they turn around and reward themselves very handsomely, which, you know, you're, you're asking the, the lower end to take cuts and to um, take one for the team, and then the team becomes the top management. It erodes trust real quick. Oh, yeah. Vulnerability is taking advantage. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Same thing. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, the, the fault is, yeah. Yeah, it's, uh, I think all of us could read that article about, you know, the spa treatments right at, at for AIG officials right after, you know, they got the bailout. Yeah. But they're going to put them off next time. They're <laughs> going to take the next trip they had planned. That was announced yesterday. Yeah. Yeah. A big one that I've seen is a reluctance to report or highlight how bad behavior is actually dealt with. Yeah. Fear, fear of legal liability if you say we actually fired this person or they were demoted. Um, that, I've, I've seen that because people, as you, as you pointed out, they make it up. You know, next thing you know, someone, someone's really been fired, but what they're thought of is that they got a, you know, a, a severance package that's better than what other people have. Yeah, yeah. It's, you know, I mean, Irvin and I work at a state agency. So, I mean, it's really difficult to get rid of people. But I mean, even if you don't, um, you know, it's, you, organizations typically are very reluctant to deal with termination, even, even when it's just blatant. Uh, but I, I think we, you know, we, and we go through this in, in incredible rationalization as to why it's okay to keep uh, someone. Uh, and. You know, and we don't think about the huge cost. But I think that is an excellent point of, you know, when we do actually get rid of someone, I mean, there, I mean, there needs to be an explanation. I mean, you know, again, and I, that goes back to the elephant in the room. It, you don't have to go through a blow-by-blow -blow play of, you know, what happened. I mean, you know, so obviously, you know, but, because you, you, there are confidential confidentiality issues, but just to ignore it entirely um, is a mistake. I mean, you know, because people will, people will talk. Yeah, I was just going to add on to what she said. I think that what she brings up is that there, you know, you talked about personal trust and organizational trust, and I think there are other, there are other levels. Yeah. You know, uh, market trust when you come to talking about your customers, mm -hmm. and then if you take a look at the problem we're in, that our markets are in right now, it's a, it's a societal trust issue. Because nobody believes anybody. <laughs> so, so let's let's. In the, we don't have all that much time left. How do how do you rebuild trust? Let's say, you know, you screwed up. You know, I mean, 
and you know, you, so you need to regain the trust that has been eroded. You know, and you know, you know, we, we all can you know kind of differentiate you know bad apples and bad barrels. And, and well, let's say we're not we're not at the bad apple. So you know, you didn't screw, you know you didn't erode the trust purposely. Um, it just you know it was a mistake, and you know so you made the big announcement. Uh, and or, you know, you said you were going to make a big announcement, and you didn't explain why. You didn't communicate as effectively as you could, and you started the rumor mill. And now everyone's pointing fingers, and then you realize, oh my gosh, what an idiot I was. Now I need to be able to try to build trust back up in my organization. I really am well intentioned. I just, you know, or I did one thing. I when I became department chair, I was very vigilant about. Um, giving all of my staff, giving them a little birthday card and a little trinket, you know, candle or something. I missed one person's birthday. Oh, oh my God. I mean, you know, that's a killer, yeah. you know. So, because again, it, you know, people go through an attribution process where they try to make sense of behavior and they definitely do that with their manager. And I didn't get this one staff member a gift. And this is after I've been in the office for three years. So there had been a pattern. I had, I took her out for lunch, you know, I mean, so, you know, we eventually were paired. But, you know, it's, again, you know, it's often well-intentioned people can make mistakes. So, so I said this scenario. All right, so how can we rebuild? Yes. I think the most important thing is to admit that you made a mistake. Why did I screw up? Yeah. And, and I did. Big time. So, seemed like a little thing, but it wasn't. But it wasn't, yeah. I think another thing is to do what you say you're going to do. We have a new uh, leader in our organization who has made quite an effort to <clears throat> say that he is not perfect, but that he is going to do his best. And if someone sees that he has done something wrong, he has invited them to let him know so that he can correct the mistake. So now we're all really interested to know if what he says is really going to work. Is his door really that open? Who's going to be the first person to go in and try it? But I'll tell you, that first person who goes in to try it and it works, is going to tell everyone. Or if it doesn't work, it's going to tell everyone. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's what we call walk the talk. <laughs> You know, so I mean, is it, you know, if you say, you know, um, hey, I, I want to have you be, feel free to criticize my ideas. So I put, I, I'm saying, I think, I think the new Coke formula is a good one. And, uh, but I'm, you know, free to, you know, feel, you know, feel free to say if, if you don't think that's a good idea. And boy, if someone comes in and says, oh, you know, that's not such a good idea, and I punish them, then yeah, you'll, you set the tone where you'll never have anyone speak up again. But so yes, if you say, you know, this is, this is how this organization is going to be, I have an open door policy, um, then you have to be willing to take it. Yeah. And I think that's right. Everyone will watch. Yeah. What else? How else can trustees rebuild? I think you take the time to learn the individuals. Um, and I'm not sure how to put it. If you make a statement that, you know, it was, it, you didn't think it was that big of a deal, but to that person, it, it was the end of the world. So, yeah. Okay. Yeah. It, 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 it is, you know, I think um, it, it takes a lot of time um, to, you know, it's a, so, and I didn't mean, mean to discount, and when I talked about the three components of trust, uh, you know, the strategic trust, you know, and then the supervisory trust at a personal level, and then organizational trust. You know, I mean, all three are very important. You know, I, I think organizational trust is critical. Uh, but, you know, that supervisory trust is important as well. And so, you know, and that's where you do take the time to get to 
to understand, you know, the people who work for you and, you know, so that they do feel comfortable, for instance, coming to you if they see a problem in the organization uh, and, you know, want to, you know, say, you know, I don't feel very comfortable with how people are, you know, this report or whatever it may be. Uh, so, and that does take time. Yeah. I think if you're in a leadership position, you have to be perceived as extending trust to others. Okay. Uh, and you know, and, and to do that, you probably have to have your own little analytical system that is not necessarily known to everybody else. Because to extend trust, you have to, you know, you got to be smart about it. So you got to think that it's, you know, you got to have some basis for doing it. But, but I think your, the, you know, your propensity to extend trust is, a, is an important element. Yeah, yeah, and, and I, that, that's a great point. And I think that goes back to my, you know, my first couple slides. You know, if we become, you know, hyper vigilant and assume that the people in our organizations are cheats and you know that they have to be watched all the time we really aren't going to be able to establish uh, a climate of trust you know so you know we have to have some faith that we've hired good people uh, and you know obviously we have we have controls in the organization but you know one of the arguments that we've made in, um, in, a, in, a, in a paper is that you know, <clears throat> over-reliance on controls can have the counterproductive effect of actually increasing corruption. So that you know, we have to find the balance between having good control systems but not having excessive control systems. So we have to have some trust in the uh, employees that we have in the organization that they will do the right thing. And in part, that's, that's dependent on having a culture in the organization that emphasizes values of integrity and doing the right thing uh, and being willing to speak up. Now, one of the um, uh, features of organizations that, that are very important is what we call um, having uh, uh, the feature that's called psychological safety, which is when employees feel that it's appropriate and okay to be able to, to report when they see something that's wrong. And not just illegal, but when they think that the organization is not making decisions that are um, beneficial. Uh, when they say the emperor has no clothes. Uh, when you know they say you know and when they feel that they can question even people um, who are higher above them even with people with higher status uh, and we know that there are some organizations which just by their nature they're lower in psychological state um, safety because of huge status differential between um, employees so for instance hospitals tend to be low uh, in psychological safety because there are huge status differences um, between doctors and nurses. So doctors tend to be very high status individuals in hospitals, nurses tend to be lower status. So, you know, so how do we get an or, you know, a hospital which is high in psychological safety such that in the, surger the surgical room, you can have a nurse feel comfortable to say to a surgeon, who often, you know, will um, feel as though they're God. And surgeons are trained that way. They're, they, they, they feel as though they have godlike qualities. Because they, they have your life in their hands when they have you on the table. How do you create a situation where that nurse can say, Doctor, I, I don't know if, that, if you should do that. Or Doctor, I think you left something in the body. <laughs> and there, believe me, there are cases of that. You know, so you know, there's been some you know good research in terms of you know how we can create you know that atmosphere where a nurse can feel comfortable of questioning what the doctor is doing. Another situation where we see these high status differences is um, in cockpit crews. Where again, we see you know, the pilot tends to be the one who is very high status, 
and that everyone else in that cockpit crew tends to be subservient. Now that one, that one makes it more interesting because you know when you're talking about a nurse versus a physician, the nurse is uh, you know is really dealing with someone else's life, and the cockpit crew, you know, you've got the say the co-pilot, it's their lives, yeah. you know, and so you you know you see you know you you, you know when you look at the black box uh, recorders of you know these um, airline crashes. You know, and you, you know, I've looked at the transcript of one. You know, you hear, you know, the cock, you know, the co-pilot going, um, uh, Dan, uh, I, th I think maybe you should pull up, and the, you know, the kind of, oh, that's ridiculous. Shut up. No, no, Dan, I, I think you should pull up. <laughs> Shut up. Bam. I mean, you know, I mean, then they just fly up to a mountain. It's like this is your own life. But because of you know the training um, of you know you don't question you know you, you get it can get into these you know very kind of subservient roles so you know and again that's how we have to you know think about how can we create organizations that are high in psychological safety so that people feel you know when they see something that's amiss that they can question. They, and that they're not going to feel any retaliation. Okay, well, I'm over on my time, but thank you very much for uh, being here, and I know we're supposed to take a break, right? Quick break, and then yeah. you yeah. yeah. switch yeah. rooms yeah. the, the other the presenter say. I say. Got it. Okay. <laughs>